I first of all want to thank you all so much for the work that you've done um, with changes that last a lifetime. And um, I don't just mean distributing the bags or tolerating the fact that sometimes the message went to the wrong agency when it wasn't supposed to. Uh, I mean um, the hard work of figuring out how is this really going to work in our agency. Are people going to be receiving their emails? What happens when people are not happy with how things are going? That is the hard part of in, in implementing any intervention, and I really want to thank you all for what you're doing with that. Um, to tie in um, what I want to talk about in terms of employee engagement is really thinking about where your employees are in that kind of um, those stages of change, thinking about sort of what can you do for people that are in different portions of that, and maybe thinking about what have you done already. Um, some of this might be taking those times where you, you're experiencing conflict. <laughs> You've got some, some people are feeling like this is too much being shoved down my throat, and they're responding back in some way. And that is a form of employee engagement that they are reaching out to you to tell you that. So um, um, that is a very uncomfortable place to be. However, that is when change happens, is when we've got these conflicting things going on, um, that that is a sign that there is something that is changing. And so it's really important to figure out how do you capture that? How do you dance rather than wrestle with the people who are maybe dissatisfied? Um, and what, what can you do to use this and use that energy in a positive way to help grow and build what you're doing. So I would be curious, does anyone have any thoughts about where you are, maybe with the spectrum of the state of change and shifting it down from that action back to those earlier stages? Or, um, or any other times where you've taken some of that difficult energy and shifted it? Sure. Um, I uh, retired from the Army in 2004, so I was in pretty good shape. It wasn't round. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I kind of laid back for a while. I went to school, and just the week started creeping up, creeping up, creeping up. And then this last March, I uh, uh, I have to go to the VA every, every year for a physical, and they put me on a scale, and I was like, oh, no, this has got to stop. This has got to stop. So... I just, uh, you know, I went through that pre-contemplated stage, the contemplated stage, and then I moved into the action stage, and now I'm in the reward stage. So uh, it's been some hard work, but uh, it's, once you get get that change going, it, it's easy to maintain it. But it's getting getting that jump start for me. It was that 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 conscious awareness of, hey, I'm getting really heavy here, you know, and it started affecting my health. So that that really worked out. Anyone else have any other examples? And one thing that when I when I hear about what's going on in the agency, I mean, I think changes the last lifetime is a good example of um, there are maybe elements of the intervention that we would like done differently. However, what we're seeing is employees. There are some employees who are changing, and maybe what that change is resulting in is they're going and lobbying the nearby food vendors to have. A, a lunch that has the appropriate portion sizes in it, rather than something that they have to throw half away or take half with them. Or... Well, I had a different example that I really thought of while, while uh, you were going through this. And, and uh, a big part of my work is to work with, in my agency, the, the person I report to and his boss who are in charge of uh, essentially purchasing health care and what it's going to look like for state employees. And, and how to integrate our program into it. And I began to realize that I, I knew this trans theoretical model quite well, but had totally forgot to apply it as I worked <laughs> with them. And um, was, of course, wanting them to move into the action phase right away and was always uh, a little disappointed and had trouble controlling um, my emotions when they weren't moving <laughs> as quickly as they might or making the right decision. And, and I was. Uh, often breaking rule number one with the R because I wanted to write them right away uh, because it just was amazing to me they didn't get it. So um, I'm going to um, really remember this as I work with them, uh, the, both the rule and, and try to assess where they are in their stages of change about 
moving in this particular direction and, and then assess why in the heck they might want to by asking them questions. Uh, so I can understand where they're at, so my presentation and, and my desires for the health of uh, PEBB would, um, <clears throat> I think, would be um, more expressed in, in what they're thinking if I can understand where they're at in their stages of change. So this was really helpful for me today to think about that part of my work. I guess um, something we've seen over the last seven or so years is that we have between 80 people and 400 out of 1,300 participate in different events. And I'm sure that there are probably more than the maximum number of 400 that are at least in the contemplative stage. But I think what that shows to me is that we probably have a couple hundred that are probably in the active and maintaining stage and that we have a good chunk of people, at least another 200 that are contemplative and, and maybe um, slipping on to that into preparation and thinking about it and dabbling with different things. And we still have a big percentage, maybe 30 to 40 percent, that probably aren't even in the, in the contemplative stage yet. And so clearly, uh, hearing this presentation and having heard one at the other H by HBM um, conference, uh, we have been trying to, we have been trying to send different messages. We have different interventions for different people. And we can continue to do a much better job of that, um, I think. And I think that one of the things, the consciousness awareness uh, displays, to use, steal your term, right, and Don, um, you know, those are intended to capture the interest and, and attention of people that are not necessarily to the contemplative stage yet or the preparation stage, and to kind of jog them and, and jog their sense of reality and understand some things and how their health may be impacted. So hopefully getting them to start to think. And clearly, I, I am trying to get us to be much more organized in the way we tap the different groups and it um, takes time. And I think even for people who are in that um, pre-contemplation state, what Frank is talking about in terms of um, behavioral, cognitive behavioral theory, uh, sometimes people will try on that behavior even if it doesn't fit who they think of themselves as. Like, well, everybody else is eating apples first now, so it's been my usual thing. All right, I'm going to eat an apple today. And they might do it begrudgingly, but they might also notice that, gosh, I you know, have a little more energy than I would up in my ordinary snap, I mean, just as an example. So sometimes that discomfort of that culture shift that people are experiencing might encourage them to try on some behaviors. Um, and it's a delicate balance, and you got to strike it carefully. But, but just be aware that if people um, express some unhappiness, it, it might not be that they're not experiencing something that is maybe benefiting them in the long term. So, and it's not that you know better, I know better. It's a matter of allowing people to try on things they might not ordinarily try on in terms of behaviors. You know, the, the, the one thing that I had forgotten to mention that Jim Prochaska really hit on the last time we talked was that when you practice a skill set, say weight management is broken down into three areas. It's broken down in what you eat, how you exercise, but then how you take care of these, you know, emotional interventions. If you pick up a skill set and focusing on one of those, that skill set you pick up applies to the other two. It's not like you have to start all over again. So if you get people into this change skill set, it can go right down across the board. So I just wanted to share from a story from one of the tele centers with changes the last lifetime and how it relates back to this work. Um, so we have a lead supervisor out there who is diabetic. Um, he came to one of the first learning sessions and he's really um, active and promoting all the stuff that's been going on. And after one of the health screenings, one of his employees um, came up to him and he, they were one of the employees that didn't realize their waist circumference was <laughs> not appropriate. <laughs> so they came up and said, I can't believe this. These results I've got, this is really scary. I don't know where to begin. And he, being diabetic, had some skills, but not, not, the, not all the skills that he needed. But he sat with his employee for the next 30 minutes and they described his action plan, his personal action plan, and what he's been changing his own personal life. And the employee and him decided to kind of tag, uh, tag team it together and join them together and do this together. And that's what we want. We want mid-level management supervisors making that part of the plan for the employee. And they need these skills. <laughs>